Thank you for coming to our site. While you're here, if you can like and subscribe and share our content, we're trying to grow. And for those who would like to comment, make comments and I will gladly answer, uh, do the best I can, make sure that we have an engaged audience. If there's something you guys would like me to talk about and teach about, just let me know and we can do that as well because I love sharing the Word of God. And for those who would like to support us financially, there are links also provided for that. And I appreciate everything that you can give. And I thank you so much. It is an honor to serve. And I look forward to continue bringing you guys good content. Good morning and welcome to my morning rant. This morning we're going to continue our study, our series on the two runners. And so today we're going to actually get into the scripture about that um, the incident with the two runners. So let me give you a little background. Um, Absalom is the son of um, of David, and uh, he wanted he listened to some folks, if you will, wanted to dethrone his father. So there was a little civil war going on amongst fractions that follow Absalom and those that stayed with um, uh, David. And David and his men pursued Absalom, and that's the background by which these two runners came about. So let's take a read of Second Samuel chapter 18, and uh, so we can at least see where we are going to be getting and extracting our information from as we go through this series. Uh, then David reviewed his troops and appointed over them commanders of a hundred and, a, and of a thousand he sent out the troop, a third on the Joab, a third on the Joab's brother Abishai, son of Zariah, and a third on to the Ittai, uh, the Gittite. And the king said to the troops, I will surely march out with you as well. But the people pleaded, you must not go out, for if we have to flee, they will pay no attention to us. Even half of us, uh, even if half of us die, they will not care but you are worth 10,000 of us. It is better for now if you support us from the city. I will do whatever you seems best uh, to you, the king replied. So he stood beside the gate while all the troops marched out by hundreds and by thousands. Now the king had commanded Joab, uh, Abishai, and Ittai, treat your son, treat the young man gently for my sake. And all the people heard the king's order to each of the commanders regarding Absalom. So David's army marched into the field to engage Israel in the battle which took place in the forest of Ephraim. There the people of Israel were defeated by the David's servant, and the slaughter was great that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the whole countryside, and that day the forest devoured more people than the sword. Now Absalom was riding on his mule when he met the servants of David. And as the mule went on the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's head was caught fast in the tree, and the mule under him kept going, so that he was suspended in mid-air. When one of the men saw this, he told Joab, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree, and uh, he said, you saw him? And uh, Joab explained, why did you not strike him to the ground right there? I would not have given, I would have given you 10,000 shek shekels of silver and a warrior's belt. The man replied, even if a thousand shekels of silver were weighed out into my hands, I would not raise my hand against the son of the king. For we heard the king command, you and Abishai and Ittai. Protect the young man Absalom for my sake. If I have jeopardized my own life and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have abandoned me. But Joab declared, I am not going to wait uh, like this with you. And he took three spears in his hand and thrusted them into the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the oak tree. And ten young men who carried Joab's armor surrounded Absalom struck him and killed him. Then Joab blew the horn, the ram's horn, and the troop broke off the pursuit of Israel because Joab had restrained them. They took Absalom, cast him 
uh, into a land, a large pit in the forest, piled a huge mound of stone over him. Meanwhile, all the Israelites fled, each to his home. During his lifetime, Absalom had set up himself a pillar in the king's valley, for he had said, I have no son to preserve the memory of my name. So he gave the pillar his name, and to this day it is called Absalom um, Monument. So that is the background by which we see these runners now are going to come on the scene. Then uh, Ahimaaz, son of Zadok, said, Please let me run to tell the king the good news, that the Lord has avenged him of his enemies. But Joab replied, You are not the man to take the good news today. You may do it another day, but you must not do so today, because the king's son is dead. So Joab said to the Cushite, Go, tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed to Joab and took off running. Ahimez, son of Zadok, however, persisted and said to jo Joab, Regardless of whatever ha may happen, please let me also run behind the Cushite. My son, Joab replied, Why do you want to run since you will not receive a reward? No matter what. I want to run, he replied. Then run, Joab told him. So Ahimez ran by the way of the plains and outran the Cushite. Now David was sitting between the two gates when the watchman went up to the roof of the gateway by the wall, looked out and saw a man running alone. He called out to the king. If he is alone, the king replied, he bears good news. As the first runner drew near, the watchman saw another man running, and he called out to the gatekeeper, look, another man is running alone. The one also bring good news, said the king. The watchman said, the first man appeared to be running like Ahiaz, son of Zedah. This is a good man, said the king. He comes with good news. Then Ahiaz called out to the king, All is well, and he bowed face down before the king. He continued, Blessed be the Lord your God. He has delivered up the men who raised their hand against my lord and king. Then the king asked, Is the young man Absalom all right? Ahimez replied, When Joab sent the king's servant and your servant, I saw great turmoil, but I do not know what it was. Move aside, said the king, and stand there. So he stepped aside. Just then the Cushite came and said, May my lord, the king, hear good news. Today the lord has avenged you of all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom all right? And the Cushite replied, May what has become of the young man happen to the enemies of my lord, the king? and to all who rise up against you to harm you. The king was shaken, went up to the great chamber, and wept. And he walked. He cried out, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of Absalom, my son, my son. So this is the story that we are going to extract and see that there is this runner uh, we see the tales of the two runner. One, uh, he took off. He, he didn't, uh, it wasn't his time to run, if you will. And we've talked about God and his timing and that God does everything in his time. Why aren't you supposed to be, uh, running? Because the news that you are about to bring is not good news, but it's not your time to run. There's another runner assigned to bring the news. And so this runner, and I uh, equate this runner as to the first church. If you look at the church today, and you see the state of the church, and we know that the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us that the, that we ought to be, um, big, making disciples, going into the world and make disciples. But we saw that uh, the church of today is not interested in that aspect of their assignment. And so they choose otherwise to create members. And we knew back in the 80s, I was there, I grew up in the church, and the big deal was how many members they had. And that's all they would be uh, toting uh, all the time. And I remember 
as a young man going out in the street witnessing on the weekend, if you will. And this is where I began to move away from the church and differ from the church, was that we went out and we were witnessing to these uh, people in the, the low-income areas, uh, wherever we went. And these people had tremendous um, salvation, encounter with God. They prayed, people got healed, all of those things. And so one day I came back into church. I'm actually, um, I was going to church and I was singing at the top of my voice, all creation worship you. And there's this beautiful song that we used to sing and everyone in the church, tears, I mean, tears used to come down my eyes as I'm crying, um, singing that song. And the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, what are you doing? If all creation is worshiping me, why are you going out on the streets on the weekend to preach the gospel? I never sang that song again because that's unbelief. And so the church is full of that. All their songs and their teaching, they, they have God on a timeline and uh, he got he has a certain time to move. They have their announcement. I mean, if you look at it, it's the same thing every single Sunday. Nothing happens because they do not give time, God time to do anything. And so he's on their schedule. If he doesn't show up on their schedule, he's not welcome, if you will. And so everyone, every Sunday for years, everyone goes in and out church and knows nothing about God because in the weekdays, none of us read our Bibles except for those who really were born again. But many of us, even those that claim to be born again, they weren't reading their Bibles. They never studied the Word. As the Scripture says, one must study to show thyself approved. You must become a disciple. When we look at the disciples of Jesus Christ, these guys were sitting there asking questions, probing questions. Jesus was probing questions. And in that exchange of conversation, they got a chance to see who he was, who they were. They understand that this is the righteousness of God, that uh, from faith to faith, that the just shall live by faith. We are called now to live by faith and not by um, uh, depending on the other kingdom, since we are in a new kingdom. And so these churches that they are called Christian churches today, they preach a different gospel than what the Bible teaches, because, again, most of them are just copying and pasting service and sermons from everyone. They're not going before the Father to get information. I'll give you an example. I was called to preach one day, and I had been studying faith for about a year. God had told me to study it. And one other aspect of faith that I was studying was he had opened a revelation about grace, what grace was. And so I had all of these books and Bibles and translations and all those things on my table, on my um, dining room table, when the pastor had come to visit. And he said to me, Ken, I'm going out on a couple of trips. I want to know if you can uh, teach on Sundays. And I said, sure, you know, um, it'll be my honor. And he looked at me and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm studying. I've been studying. God has been studying on uh, faith and grace and all of these things for about a year or so now. And then he said to me, I looked at him and I said, so how do you study? How do you, how do you do yours? And he says, oh, no, I don't do that. He said, I just get up every Sunday and I wing it. And I remember hearing that and realizing I have put my family in danger by putting them onto a space by which a pastor is not studying. He's not going before God to get information to feed me. He's just winging it. So that's dangerous. And in fact, I'll give you an incident that happened in the church. We were in church and you could see this demon-possessed woman walked up in the church, foaming at the mouth. And my sons, I had my four sons with me sitting up front in the church. And this woman comes up, and you little, literally looking at her with foam coming out of her mouth. And I know from reading the scripture, it tells me that that person got something in there. And so we were watching this event, and that pastor that said he rings it, lays his hand on this woman and says, let your burden be mine. And he got hit, fell on the ground. My kids are looking at this, and these boys, we spent time together praying and reading the Word. And they looked at me, these are five, six, seven, eight-year-old kids, younger than that, I think. Joshua was younger. They looked at me and said, Dad, all of this is against the Word of God. Let's go. And I looked at my sons, and I got up, 
walked out of the church and I never looked back because those boys were 100% right. I didn't even check on what happened to him because I knew what happened to him. They jumped from that woman and jumped straight into him. Those are the church that are claiming to be Christian that have people following them. I was in one of the biggest churches in Florida and they allowed preachers to come in and tell people, we have the $500 line, the $100 line, the $50 line for you to come up and get prophecies, the $20. And then you have, for those special prophecies, we got the thousand and above line. You come up and we're going to give you this special prophecy. And they did this in the church. They're doing this, I'm telling you. They are doing this. This is the first runner. I'm going to read you a couple of um, things that I've been collecting about this current church. Compassionate Christian authoritarianism, the leftist utopiator, the right think will save the church. Wow, I mean, these guys are absolutely crazy. Exclusive, DeSantis and his backers paid $95,000 to the Iowa Religious Leader Group documents show. We have another uh, article. It says, Michael Youssef holding worldwide evangelic event to combat fading gospel understanding part two. We have a Christian series from this um, bearing false witness and the historic lies we cherish. These are the titles of stuff that is happening within the first runner. This is the church historian Tom Holland. Today's Christians' culture is trying to purge its, itself of Christianity. And uh, it continues. It talks about former top church official warns Christianity is in crisis if people think quotes from Jesus are liberal talking point. Evangelicals now hate Jesus because he sounds like a liberal wimp. This is this is the church. Pat Robinson prays for Satan to stop making people believe Joe Biden won the election. These are some of the leaders within that first uh, church, the first run, an overdue reckoning in evangelical churches. I'm just reading stuff for you guys. Yeah? Christian Nation series, Bearing False Witness and Systemic Racism within the church. Religious Trauma Syndrome, How Some Organized Religion Leads to Mental Health Problems. This is the first run. Wake up. Trump-loving evangelical warns they have been taken in by a hoax. This is the church. I'm just reading. In a battle for rights, Christians are losing sight of God's primary mission. No kidding. Um, they have no power. This is commentary. The greatest threats to Christianity in the United States is not from the outside forces, but from within. The Bible tells us, God says, I will judge my house first. Outrage after a uh, spoken mayor attend Christian nationalist concert at nearby wildfire burn. Fight this wicked idolatry. Evangelical fundamentalists declare war on white Christian nationalism. The rapture. I'm just, again, uh, a theological misstep of religious sci-fi fantasy. Christian persecution of, or being called on the carpet. This magnum musician uh, to pray event call for blaze to sweep over city like a fire sweeping through wood. Why some evangelical are embracing racism. The first runner. This is the condition of the first runner. They have no power. They do not have a single thing that Jesus talks about. And you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Nothing is being talked about any of this. Pastor introduced AI-generated sermon during a church service in Texas. Who are woke? It says, who are woke Christians? And have we seen them before? One of the biggest lies, madness, that I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, this is, you know, it, it is so sad to report these things. Uh, you know, uh, we talk about a North Dakota Republican unleashes Christian nationalist rant calling for Christ 
his king law. These are foolish people. One of the things that we saw within the church, the first run-up, was that they, uh, as I mentioned to you, slavery, all of the things that God tells that one should not partake in. The church should have been fighting for them. The church should be the one taking care of the poor. We saw in the book of Acts that Christians were selling their property, bringing it to, bringing it to the disciples so that they can take care of the poor, the widow, um, the fatherless, and all of those things in the, that were it, all those Thai people that were in the church. Today, we see that these men are hoarding, uh, their church money. They're stealing from the people. Ananias and Sapphira, we know about them. This is a husband and wife, uh, that, uh, had plotted against God. They were going to sell and hide and stuff. And they came before the disciples and, and lied. And the disciple says, why did you come before, uh, and lied to the Holy Ghost, which is God. No, you lied to God. The Holy Spirit is God. They fell down and died. Why one died? And they, while they were taking him out, his wife came in and said the same thing. She died and they took him out. That's the power that the church had. The first runner have nothing that looks like the church. Nothing. They are talking about masculinity, Christian masculinity, all kinds of madness that I've never seen in my life or heard. That one would have time for this Missouri pastor on upcoming book burning. If God told me to burn the book of Clifford the Big Red Dog, then I'll burn the book of Clifford the Big Red Dog. Do you think that God Almighty is interested in burning Clifford the Big Red Dog book when he's talking about preaching the gospel? He who wins souls is wise. These men and women that are in the first runner do not have the message. And they are dead as can be. And all they can teach you in your church while you are there is death. And you will become a curse. Everything that you do, because the Bible says, he who preach a different gospel than what we are preaching, as Paul talks, talks about, that person, that church, that religion is cursing. And so I want to say to you that most, I would say, probably all of these churches out there that is preaching a different thing than the, what, uh, Paul said. He said, even if an angel comes and preach something different, it's a curse. And so either it is a curse or not, either we believe the word of God or we don't. And so I want to bring to your attention all the things that you are seeing today is out of a curse. No power, no laying on of hands, no feeding the poor, not really feeding, feeding the poor. The, uh, those mega churches that have those 10,000 plus people in their church, you should not have a single poor person in your vicinity at all, at all. All of that wealth that they, the church have collected, not even the people that are in the church, because they'll try to milk the people of the church to take care of the poor when they're accumulating the pastors I'm talking about. These leaders got themselves jets, two jets, three jets, best car, um, uh, a big mansion, and the Bible tells us who they are. Wherever your heart is, there will be your treasure also. The first runner. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight.